we believe that being a defender requires more than building shooting skills on a range. It's also a development of the heart, mind, body, and spirit. Join us as we explore what it truly means to be a defender in your training and in your everyday life. Welcome to Defenders Live. Hello, everyone. You're watching Defenders Live with Laura Thorson. Thank you so much for attending tonight. We have a special, special uh, episode planned for you tonight, and I cannot wait to get started. So, as always, Adam Winch from Defenders USA is behind the scenes and helping me. He may jump on. He may not. We never know. But he is uh, here with us as well. And um, I also want to invite you guys that if you find value in these live streams, please invite others to join the Defenders Live Facebook group. That is where you will find all of the up-to-date information on Defenders Live, as well as clips throughout the week of the highlights of our live streams. I do have a quick tidbit of the week this week before we bring our special guest on, John McLaughlin with Iowa Fire Firearms Coalition. Um, so stay tuned for that. But really quickly, uh, this is something that I'm changing gears on just a little bit. Uh, the tidbit of the week this week is called doing hard things. So as we talk about getting uncomfortable and doing hard things on this channel in order to foster growth and self-reflection in our lives, uh, we as instructors, we talk about um, tuning into our students' emotions and comfort zones in order to know just the right amount of push or pull or backing off that we might need in order for them to develop the way that works best for them, right? Um, because what's hard for one person might not be the same for another person. And I've learned a valuable lesson lately about doing hard things that I want to share with you. Now, hang in here with me, guys. It's a little bit different, but it's a little bit different take than I normally would talk about. But I think it's really important. So uh, I can't be the only one, but in the past couple of months, for the past couple of months for me have been a little bit challenging. Um, I've admittedly allowed myself to kind of slide sideways into the holiday season. Can anybody else relate to that? Um, you know, creating a practical food coma on Christmas Day and then not feeling very good afterwards, having a, sort of a Christmas hangover in some ways, and just kind of allowing myself to slack in many areas. Um, personally, really, not work-wise, but personally. And was it all worth it? No, not really. The Christmas cookies were good, but they really weren't worth, <laughs> they weren't worth how I felt afterwards, right? And there comes a point, at least for me, where I just get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Can anyone else relate? You just get to this point where you can only tolerate so much. And so I got back on the horse recently, and little by little, I've been getting back to being the me that I enjoy being a little bit healthier, a little bit more active, and that all translates to a happier me and a happier people around me too, right? So for those of you out there who also struggle with this, because I know I'm not the only one, in fact, I might be preaching to the choir, right? I want you to think about doing something hard, but not in the way that many of us have been taught. I want you to take a look at your values and your beliefs. How do you define yourself? What is your identity? How you identify yourself will ultimately dictate your thoughts and your behaviors. Now, let's just say on an imaginary scale of one to 10, you tell yourself all the reasons why you will never be a 10. Okay. And I don't mean a 10 in how you look, guys. I mean in 10 and whatever that is to you, whether that's being, you know, really successful in life, maybe that's being the best father you can be or the best mom you can be or the best you know, spouse or whatever that looks like to you, right? You listen to others who tell you the same thing that you can never be that and you believe it for whatever reason, you will perpetually be stuck at the at that level or lower, at a five or lower because you will unconsciously and consciously live your life at that lower level. So let's say you think of yourself as a five level because you grew up that way and every person in your family is that way and so on and so on. And somehow through circumstance, you level up to a 10, let's say, okay? And you become wildly successful or whatever 10 looks like to you. If you're still in a five mindset, you will sabotage yourself and end up right back where you were to begin with because your values and your beliefs didn't align with that. 
Are you getting what I'm, are you picking up what I'm putting down here, guys? Is this making any sense? So this is all in theory, but I hope you understand what I'm getting at. I'm not saying that you can think your way to a 10, right? For a virtual 10, not at all. You cannot think your way into anything, but your thoughts and your beliefs are where everything else in your life stems from, which is your behaviors and your actions, right? So here's a hard thing for you to contemplate tonight. Ask yourself, what do you really believe about yourself? What do you really believe about yourself? Do you believe you're the type of person who procrastinates because it's an excuse you've made in the past and so now, well, that's just who you are? Do you believe that you're never going to achieve X, Y, Z and you have just resolved that that's just the way it is because of these reasons? And well, I guess I'll just live that way because I don't know what else to do. I don't know what to do any differently, right? In, in talking about doing hard things, hard things are not always about lifting heavy things, gritting your way through life, being the tough guy or the tough gal or always being the strong person. The hard things are usually the internal conflicts, the quiet vulnerability that we resist because it's just too uncomfortable so we keep ourselves busy with less important things. It's the difficult conversations we avoid having because we don't want to be truthful and we're fearful about how that conversation could go. Or it could be the honest conversations with ourselves about being truly honest about the excuses we make and the lies we tell ourselves. And the lies you tell yourself can be very powerful, but only if you aren't aware they're a lie and you actually buy into them. And hey, I'm not, I'm not lecturing at all here, guys. I've bought into plenty of lies. We all have, right? I've been down this path and I struggle with all these things. That's why I'm bringing this up because this is on my heart tonight. So perhaps those lies are disguised, are instead disguised or even stem from fear. One of my favorite songs is called Fear is a Liar by Zach Adams. And I would love for you to look it up and listen to it because the lyrics are very powerful. I really strongly encourage you to look that up. So in closing, what do you truly believe about yourself? Think about that. Truly. As defenders, we train to do hard things that others may not even want to think about. If we can do that, let's also not be afraid to do the hard work within ourselves. All right, so that's tonight's tidbit of the week, and let's move on to our special guest, John McLaughlin from Iowa Firearms Coalition. So John is the chair of Iowa Firearms Coalition, a firearms instructor, current FAA instructor, and former meteorologist in central Iowa for over 30 years. John's underlying mission of helping protect and prepare people is woven throughout his life experiences. Join me as we talk about John's incredible story of perseverance, life lessons in unexpected places, and above all, his unwavering dedication and heart to serve others. Without further ado, let's bring on John McLaughlin. Hi, John. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I was just uh, humming fear is a liar in my head. So good choice there to start this <laughs> Isn't that a great song? It is indeed. Yeah, I was so running to that song actually this morning and and it's there's just the lyrics are just so powerful. So I hope you guys do look that up. Yeah, I, I'll jump in here a second. I, I appreciate the message leading into this and I understand you're going to be doing the uh active self-protection instructor course coming up. Is that is that a true rumor? Yeah, that's starting in January. Great. So one of the books they had us read, I don't know if they still do it, but when Adam and I went through is a book by Lanny Basham called With Winning in Mind. Oh, yeah, I've and heard of that it's, book. It's exactly what you're just talking about, developing that self-image of what you want to be, what you want to look like, and uh, how to just develop that mental management sy system of getting where you need to be and you know blocking out the extraneous stuff. So I think you'll really enjoy going through the course and uh, it changed how I teach, and I think you'll appreciate that too. So back to you wow. now. Wow, I'm looking forward to it even more now. That's great. I, I can't wait. I hope that book is still uh, part of the curriculum. So we'll see. I'm sure it is. I've heard that uh, that book title over and over again. 
All right. Well, John, um, not everyone knows you, so I would love if you wouldn't mind just sharing. I tried in the intro to, to share a little bit about your background, but I would love to hear it um, in your words, if you don't mind. And, um, and then we'll move on from there. Yeah, I'm just uh, an Iowa kid, grew up in western Iowa. Uh, I understand you were in Creston for a while, so I was about an hour yeah. north of there in Carroll, Iowa, and uh, went to school at Iowa State and then on to Mississippi State University. Uh, so I've got uh, plenty of college and spent 31 years in Des Moines for the CBS affiliate uh, as their meteorologist, spent uh, a lot of time doing severe weather, covering tornadoes across Iowa, and almost 20 years uh, speaking at conferences, writing peer-reviewed papers on Doppler radar and severe storms. So a heart really geared toward protecting uh, the folks in Iowa against severe weather. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of at the same time, I ran a, a company in Iowa with a friend of mine that was called Learn to Shoot Iowa, where we focused on taking people well beyond uh, just getting their concealed carry permit, trying to give them some very uh, solid training, a good foundation in firearms, more than just fire. 25 shots and take this to the sheriff and get your permit. And then uh, also uh, ran a company in Iowa called Iowa Helicopter, where we did helicopter training tours, uh, flew a volunteer stuff for the police department when we'd have an Alzheimer walk away or something like that. And uh, currently um, no longer in TV because of an illness. I uh, developed what was called sarcoidosis, which is an autoimmune disease. And so I uh, retired from television, which is what I thought I would do my whole life but uh, still do check rides for the FA for folks in airplanes and helicopters, still teach firearms on the side when needed. And uh, the last several years, my focus, as you mentioned, has been uh, chair of a volunteer org in Iowa called the Iowa Firearms Coalition. And our focus has been over the last uh, well, almost 10 years, getting a constitutional amendment approved in Iowa to actually recognize and protect the second amendment. And finally, after a lot of effort and moving from May issue to shell issue to constitutional carry. Then uh, just uh, last month in November, we got the issue passed. So the uh, Second Amendment now fully protected in Iowa. So even if our uh, national scene changes uh, with government, Iowa still has it on their constitution. And uh, we, uh, we prize our liberties and we will protect them in Iowa. Wow, that is a lot, John. That is incredible. <laughs> I mean, think about what you've accomplished, you know, since you first started your career to what you're doing now, there is an, an underlying theme. When you think about it, there is a parallel to all of these things. And I well, do believe it it's is. about protecting others. Is it not? It's definitely, I would, I, I've had that, uh, as long as I can remember a, a heart for protection, uh, mm -hmm. you know, throughout my entire career in, in meteorology, the, the thing I preached all the time is, you know, we don't wait for the National Weather Service to issue a warning. If we see something on the radar, if we see a threat that is going to hurt somebody, we're on the air instantly and talking about that. And I, I would tell my crew at, at the TV station, you know, you don't wait. If you see something, you go on the air and tell someone because I do not want in my career to have some family call me and say, you know, my loved ones died because you weren't there. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, you know, in Iowa over the years, we did have loss of life and tornadoes and severe storms. but. Uh, with one rare exception, <laughs> I've never had anybody come up and say, hey, you really missed that storm. It hit our house. Uh, you know, something horrible happened. Uh, mm -hmm. And the only time that ever did happen is my uh, manager at the time had come into the TV station and said, John, you've been on the air long enough. And I said, no, no, this is a dangerous storm. We have to stay on. And he goes, mm -hmm. no, Oprah is starting at four o'clock. We have to go to Oprah. And so they went to Oprah, cut away from our radar coverage. And there was a a bar in Southeast Iowa where everybody in the bar was watching our TV station and they thought, Oh, they've just cut away. They're back to programming. There must not be a threat. About two mm. minutes later, the tornado hit that bar and killed two people. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So wow. my boss said after that, I will never question the meteorologist again. <laughs> if you guys need to be on the air, you're on the air. And we had a, a run of uh, being number one in weather and, uh, one of those rare TV stations where you just got to do exactly what the meteorologist thought needed to be mm -hmm. done in severe weather. So it was a really great career for 30 years. And can you, could you speak to, you know, the mindset because as a pilot and as a defender, and even as a meteorologist, to be frank, um, there's a certain preparedness mindset that all three of those 
uh, require. And so is there anything that you've learned in any of the other other professions, a pilot or meteorologist that can be applied to the daily preparedness of a defender? Absolutely. I started teaching firearms in the early 2000s. Uh, one of the common things we would hear, especially from law enforcement or ex-military, you're a TV guy. What do you know about you know, <laughs> self-defense and teaching firearms? I said, well, I'm also a pilot examiner. I let people try to kill me for a living. And <laughs> in the helicopter world, if you have a failure, especially in some of the smaller helicopters, the difference between life and death and an engine failure is about 1.7 seconds. So if you lose your rotor RPM that's spinning over your head, that decays at about 10% per second. And you get down around 82, 83%, you're not coming back. So that's about 1.7 mm -hmm. seconds. So the same thing a cop in, endures under fire, the same thing the military, the time standing still, the audio exclusion, uh, all that stuff happens in emergencies in aircraft. So my goal mm -hmm. is to teach people just like I do in firearms to reach that unconsciously competent stage where everything's been myelinated through the neural pathways and you can instantly react, put shots on target or in the helicopter world, get the collective down, F cyclic right pedal, enter the auto rotation, and then a uh, good chance of having a positive outcome. So, and even in the weather world, it was all, you know, that left the bang kind of stuff we study, knowing what mm -hmm. you're looking for, seeing it, recognizing it before it can kill you and letting folks know about it. Yeah. And doesn't the airline industry have a really strict protocol about your uh, your mental state before you pilot an airplane and talk you through, you know, <laughs> being honest with yourself about that self-awareness? I think that yeah. should be applied to the everyday carrier as well, because you're not in the same frame of mind mentally or you're feeling yeah. not very well one day, maybe or something. I mean, how could that be applied as well? Yeah, absolutely. On every check ride I do, whether it's airplanes or helicopters, the, the applicants have to talk to me about uh, risk mitigation. And the FA has all kinds of acronyms. One of them is I am safe, where we go through illness, alcohol, medication, stress, fatigue, uh, you know, external factors, emotions, and all that applies to the handgun world. If I, mm -hmm. I tell people in a real world emergency, you're going to degrade to about 50%. So you don't want to start the day at 70% of your ability, and then today's the day that you have the real-world emergency, and suddenly you're reduced by half. Now you're only 35% as good as you should be on a on a perfect day. And mm -hmm. uh, so think of that if you're you know, going yeah. into a hazardous environment. You don't want to be mentally uh, deficient. Maybe you didn't get a good night's sleep. Maybe uh, didn't even eat breakfast, uh, you know, mm -hmm. argument with the spouse. All those things will impact you very negatively when uh, when your moment is called. Yeah, so important. And I don't think something that gets talked about a lot. So I wanted to bring that up. Um, yeah, especially the stress and fatigue part. That's where we see the, the biggest right. breakdown. The folks, you know, they, they've missed a night of sleep or they're stressed because they're, they're taking a check ride or doing an evaluation. And boy, you can see it. And folks don't recognize it until it happens. And then they say, you know what you talked about? I, you know, I heard degraded in stress. I saw that. And I said, yes, when you, when you do a check ride, that is really how you're going to prepare or you're going to you know, handle yourself in an emergency. So it gives us an insight into the, the pilot's mind in this case of how they will perform when the chips are down. Right. Now, can we talk a little bit about church security and medical training? Because I know those are two specific areas that you're pretty passionate about, that you're involved in um, for the folks out there that, uh, that might have questions perhaps about church security and approaching uh, their own churches about uh, yeah. the need for that? How, how can one go about that? Yeah, that church security, school security, it's all uh, very close to my heart. It's something I've been involved in, especially since uh, getting out of the, uh, the television industry in 2016. So while I was doing TV and running the firearms company on the side, we started an outreach called Faith, Fellowship, and Firearms, the three Fs. And what we wanted to do was take the biblical example of discipleship and then take people and use that as the example of training them in firearms. So we ended up with a group of about 18 people that spent uh, the summer basically learning how to be a disciple and then transferring those skills to, okay, how can I teach somebody firearms or what can I do to instill uh, these values in someone to be a church defender? And so we took people with virtually zero knowledge of firearms, and by the end of the summer, they were very highly capable. 
And so we can, you know, take the, the model of what Christ did disciple wise and apply that to, you know, training these uh, church security individuals. So it's more than just sending them to a school for a couple of days or something, you know, it's pouring yourself into them, watching them, mentoring them, giving them advice, keeping them positive through the process. And then we culminated that summer. We went out to a four day class in, in Nevada and got together and had a great time and did the shoot house and all that kind of stuff. But uh, that really got me focused on, uh, you know, building a team. Uh, so after I left the TV industry, uh, started spending the winters down in Arizona, got affiliated with a church down here and uh, was able to work with them, eventually led their Saturday uh, team security for uh, until about a year ago. And then I had to step away from that because of some medical things with uh, my youngest son. And uh, anyway, it's very close to my heart. I uh, help an organization that's called Faith Based Security Network, FBSNAmerica.com. And uh, Guy named Carl Chin. He's he's a Colorado person, and he was involved in uh, the focus on the family hostage situation. I think that was back in the '90s, and then later uh, the Colorado New Life, uh, Colorado Springs New Life uh, church shooting. He was uh, part of that security team. Anyway, he started that organization, so uh, kind of helped him get going with uh, some communication software. And uh, it's a great organization. I highly recommend that if you have folks that that are building a church team and need you know plans or mentorship. It's a good, solid organization to, to uh, affiliate yourself with. So, John, I want to jump in here for a, yeah, I want ahead. to jump in here for a second here. Um, you talk, you're talking about the Faith-Based Security Network, which I'm a huge fan of, right? What Carl Chin and others have done. Yep. I think it's just fantastic. Um, you brought up something about, you know, uh, arming and helping train those who decide to do so. Uh, I'd like to get your observations, but something I've noticed on this is if you even look back at the at the Bible, right? Even Christ himself basically armed 20% of his followers, of his 12 disciples, right? He even said, hey, at least two of you sell your cloak if you have to to get the defensive weapon of the era, which in that case of the day was the sword, right? The knife, the sword, the lance. So so taking that concept, bringing it into the modern era, my thought on this is that even in our churches, right, some of us are called to certain different tasks, have different gifts, whether it's preaching, whether it's working in the nursery, whether it's something. I think that we as Christians have a have a have a uh, some of us have a ministry within the church itself as being the defenders of life within church. That doesn't mean the whole church should be armed, the entire everything. But for those who decide to do so. Getting that willful training like you're talking about, going out and studying this and 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 preparing for the defensive life within the church itself is important. And mm -hmm. because you mentioned it, can you dive a little bit deeper in there? Right. I, that's something I think is such a such an important component that we all need to think about. And, man, I'd, I'd love to just keep digging this hole with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that, that was really on my heart. And when I was in Des Moines for all the years. I uh, attended a very large church and actually reached out to the staff there and said, you know, we get literally thousands of people over a weekend that are coming in here. And uh, they really didn't have an interest in a, in a uh, formed team. So we just kind of organically did things under kind of underneath the radar that they didn't even know about. But what what I would tell people out there is it, it's definitely easiest to move this ahead at a, you know, a smaller community type church with a couple hundred members. But you have to get the pastors buy in and you have to have them know that this is a legitimate ministry. Whether you want to call it church security or safety and security or life team ministry, whatever you want to call it, it is a legitimate ministry. People, the warriors like yourself and Laura, you know, we have that within ourselves to step into harm's way. And that doesn't mean that we're always out there, you know, looking to get into a battle. It could be as simple as. I'll give you a quick instance. You know, the pastor's kid fell and split his knee open. Well, who do they call? They call the security guy. Boom. We're over there putting the stereo strips on, saving the day just for little things like that. We're walking around the parking lot when it's 115 degrees and checking the cars and talking to a lady that was in her car. And I said, why are you here? There's a service going on inside. And it's, well, my husband's in the hospital down the road and I didn't know what to do. It looks very grief, uh, bad. So I just decided to drive to a church. So I opened the door and thought, would you like to go inside? Or I said, you know, I can pray with you right here. And she goes, would you? And so we did. We prayed in the parking lot on a miserable hot day. And she goes, why are you out here? Do you guys just like walk around looking for old women to pray with? And I said, yeah, actually, that's, that's what we do. So you have to have that heart. And a friend 
friend of mine, Stephen, who worked here in Arizona in the winter for a while and has moved on now. But, you know, every day we would start our, our team meetings with that we are missionaries first and gatekeepers second. We love people until yeah. they give us a reason not to. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Love continuously, but defend right. if you need to, which is another component of love. Yep. Well, thank you. I'll and jump back in. You know, a quick story from the, the church world. Uh, had a guy that came on campus and was hanging out by the uh, where the kids go out and play in a gated nursery area. And he had a bag, so it looked like alcohol or something. And uh, so we went, and we had a little conversation with him, and he made it very clear that he was uh, armed with a knife and that he was very good. In fact, he had three knives. And that he could get to us and the little guy next to me who was a jujitsu guy. So I wasn't really concerned about him. He called him a, a fire plug or something. <laughs> I said, I'm pretty sure my nine millimeters faster than your knife. But anyway, we had a conversation and I said, you, you need to go home. You need to get rid of the alcohol, get rid of your knives. And you should consider coming back to church and just listening. Well, that guy ended up coming back the next week. I babysat him, sat next to him. We started in a conversation. He came back like a week later and accepted Christ, got baptized, then checked himself into drug treatment. And I talked to him just a couple months ago. And, you know, his life is still not straightened out. But at least, you know, we could we turned what could have been a bad situation into something where we could actually start a ministry process. And, you know, you plant the seeds. You can't guarantee that, you know, they're always going to take place but or uh, grow. But at least it's in there. It's rattling around and uh you know, continue to pray for this guy, Bruce, that uh, he, he stays on a, a better path than he was on when we first met him. That's the Lord's work right there. There you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Could so you speak? Ask, go ahead. Could you speak to the medical training component as well? Because I, I also think that's another uh, we get questions about. And um, I think that a lot of people taking a concealed carry class unless it's brought up, don't even consider the, you know, yep. the importance of having medical training. Yeah. Even if you're not a firearms person, you need medical on right. you because you're far more likely to, to run into a situation where you're going to need to, uh, you know, stop somebody's uh, traumatic uh, bleeding. So every day I have one on my ankle. So I've got all the good tools in here that I need. So literally, I, I can't really remember a day where I haven't worn this unless I'm in a pool or something, but even hiking, it's so used to just having, you know, something on my ankle. I've waded across streams and then thought, Oh crap, I had uh, all my medical gear on my ankle, but uh, mm -hmm. it, it's definitely very important. Um, saving a life, you know, imagine you, you're pulling up to a car wreck and you check on people and someone's got, you know, a broken femur or blood's gushing out. That person has literally, you know, seconds to maybe a couple of minutes to live. And by having the tools on your person and the training and having done some, you know, some drills so that, uh, you know, you can stay focused and do what's required uh, is just, just amazing. So for the last six or seven years, uh, I took a TCCC course. And now uh, my youngest son, the one I mentioned that I kind of stepped away from the day-to-day -day church security stuff to uh, help him. He's he's a trauma nurse in the ER in uh, Tulsa. And uh, so he called me when I, Dad, all this stuff, you know, we trained and all these, you know, fake gunshot wounds and the fake knife wounds and putting on the tourniquets. He says, yeah, that's what I do every day now. You know, I just had a guy come to the ER, try to blow his face off or whatever with a shotgun. And so I've got a good resource, you know, over the last several years now of Okay, from what we were taught to you know, someone who deals with this every day. Mm -hmm. But this was the kid who, you know, even when he first got his driver's license, he had a full trauma kit in the trunk of his car in case he came across something. And then, uh, so he's he's helped me see the importance of that. And just a, a, mm -hmm. another quick rollback. So my son, Nathan, uh, he's been off work for over a year now because somebody came into the ER that he had previously treated that was in a machete fight and the guy left and then came back into the ER and they said, Nathan, please come to the front desk. And Nathan came out and the guy was very agitated. He goes, you know, we've done what we can for you. You, you know, you can't stay in the hospital. You need to go down to the, the shelter or the warming station or whatever. And the guy threw a bag down and came at Nathan and said, well, this is going to be a murder suicide. Oh my and gosh. so my son had to go hand to hand with this much larger individual and ended up in quite the scuffle broke through the, the front sliding doors of the hospital and spilled outside and just happened to have a couple of cops that drove through the parking lot as this nurse is on top of this guy. Uh, 
So he calls me at 1.30 in the morning. He goes, Dad, you remember all the hand-to-hand -hand trading we did and how I'd get mad at you and I'd go to the car because you hurt me? And thank you so much <laughs> for doing that because I had to use every bit of this tonight to not just save my own life but protect the folks in the ER. But in the process, he, he hurt his back pretty severely and uh, been through three surgeries now. So I, I have the flexibility to, to run to Oklahoma now and hang out with him to, to help him when, when needed. And hopefully he'll get back to work. But sad to see your 25-year-old having to walk with a cane because he did the right thing. Wow. Oh my gosh. Yes, that definitely. Wow. Hey guys, I want to remind you that we're going to be doing a Q and a towards the end, which is actually coming up here pretty soon. Uh, so I want to encourage you if you have any questions as we go along here, please put those in the comments. And we do see that there are some that we will be addressing during the Q and a session. So stick around and, and, uh, and for the question, the Q and a, uh, answer Q question and answer. I don't know why all of a sudden I just can't talk <laughs> anyway. Okay. So let's switch gears here for just a minute, John, because I know you have, uh, you know, you, uh, you t told us about you, um, going through, uh, the reason why you had to retire as a meteorologist. Yep. And, um, I wanted to ask you about that because I wonder, um, I, I've seen you in a previous video talking about how you were forced to, to slow down, um, that you weren't able to do the things that, that you, you, you know, were used to doing or that you wanted to do because of this illness. And I'm just curious to know, um, how have you changed from that period of time when you were first diagnosed to now? Because what was that? How many years ago? Seven years ago was that yeah, my, my last time on air was uh in uh, september of 2016 mm -hmm. so basically from from college through my entire career was at one place basically doing the same thing meteorology i absolutely loved it i loved doppler radar i helped the tv station build three radar systems i taught all over the united states teaching doppler radar systems got to travel overseas and even to barcelona to do an international presentation on radar systems so I, I tell people, and this is absolutely the truth, there was not one day in more than 30 years that I did not look forward to going to work. It was never like, oh, I got to go to work. I loved what I did. I loved TV mm -hmm. meteorology. I loved keeping people out of harm's way. But I started to develop a cough when I was at work, and it got to be annoying. In fact, people would go on social media, oh, it's coughing McLaughlin, and they'd make fun. And I had every test in the world done. I had to uh, you know, a little operation on my throat and they're trying all these things to figure out what was happening. And finally, in uh, April, May of 2015, it just got really bad where I could barely breathe when I was at work. And it's like there's something going on here. And uh, did the five o'clock news and couldn't make it even to the six o'clock news, ended up over in the ER and they x-rayed my lungs and they said, well, we've got bad news. You either have uh, pulmonary embolisms or you have lung cancer and neither one are good. It's like, oh boy, well, that doesn't sound good. And they said, so we're going to schedule you for a biopsy and see what happens. So they did the biopsy and they came back in a couple of days and said, well, you don't have lung cancer, so that's good. And they're not pulmonary embolism, so that's good. But they said, do you uh, like live or work in an environment that has, you know, mold or water damage or anything? And it turned out that my lymph nodes and up into my lungs, all the spots they saw was uh, basically fungus from oh, uh, years and years of, of breathing in mold through the ventilation and stuff. And uh, so basically I, I had to walk away from a job I absolutely loved to, to save my life. And the doctor said, if you go back in there, you likely, you know, the next time you come into ER, you may not make it through here because I was down to like 37% lung capacity, something really horrible. Oh my gosh. So, but it was like severe weather season. And finally, after like six weeks, I was rehabbing and I was actually, you know, I was out of the building, I was feeling better lost a lot of weight, didn't look very good, but I talked my uh, doctor and at least let me come back at night. Let me just do the 10 o'clock news. And so he says, all right, well, if you wear a mask and, you know, and just take it off before you do the weather. So I did. And I lasted like, I don't know, two or two and a half weeks and back in the, the doctor's office again with the horrible cough and all that. So ended up very fortunate. I uh, had to quit the TV job, which again, I love. Went to the Cleveland Clinic and met a doctor in Ohio that had worked with the, the firefighters and the responders from the 9-11 the disaster in New York. And she said, like, you're exactly what we're looking for. Someone that's had all these contaminants in the lungs. He goes, I know what to do. And uh, they started giving me infusions of basically a rheumatoid arthritis drug called Remicade, which 
kills off your immune system. So if someone sneezed six blocks away, I'd get horribly sick. But it suppressed the immune system, let the body kind of heal. So over the last, it took about two years before I was to the point where I could do much of anything. But mm. gradually it's gotten a little better and better. So I, I'm back to more of a normal life now. Still can't do the, you know, TV at night, <laughs> flying in the morning, teaching firearms on weekends. So I'm not that person anymore. But the, the physical part of that was was horrible. Uh, Mindy, my gal, would drive me all over the, you know, like I said, to doctor's appointments and just really took care of me, basically quit her job to take care of me. But mentally it was like, God, you know, this is what I did at TV Meteorology. You gave me this gift. And mm -hmm. uh, at the time, one of the active self-protection guys, Sam Middlebrook with Red Hawk Firearms uh, out in uh, Yakima, he said, John, God doesn't use you because you're a meteorologist. God will use you where you are. And that was really profound. So I, I was went to a conference in Omaha on church security with the FBSN and listened to Carl Chin and Colonel Grossman and Greg Stevens from the uh, uh, Garland, Texas uh, shooting down there with the ISIS guys. And it, I actually physically, people will think this is weird, but it was like there was a tap, tap, tap on my shoulder. And I looked over my right shoulder and there was nobody there except for, you know, people way behind me. And mm -hmm. then I heard this voice said, John, you can do this. It's like, <laughs> okay, I think I got the signal here what I should be working on. So that's when I really, uh, you know, dug into the whole church security world. But uh, I, I'm a driven person. I'm People call me the type A personality and a type B body. Uh, so, you know, so I'm not a <laughs> I'm driven all the time to set goals and accomplish goals. And if I get involved in something, I don't do it at a low level. So, you know, when I was teaching firearms, I have to do it at an instructor, uh, instructor level. If I'm going to be a pilot, I have to be at an instructor level. And so that's kind of how I looked at uh, the church security and the medical thing. Okay, I've got to go out and get some significant training, train with the same type of people that, you know, you and Adam have been with and get a good base that, that I can take and pull like the pieces that I think are most appropriate and structure that into to training others. I was just really curious though, because you mentioned that you were, you were a type A personality and I can, I can attest to being that as well. If I were to come down with a life threatening disease and had a career of 30 years, I'm not sure I would bounce back the way that you're describing. I mean, there had to be a period there where things were really tough and were there any lessons that you learned? Like, are you the same person now as you were then? Or have you have you um, become a better person because of it? Was there was there a silver lining, I guess, is what I'm trying to, to decide here. Uh, I think this, the silver lining is that you still have value. Right now, it's just a different audience. So I'm not serving, mm. you know, 100,000 people a night watching the 10 o'clock news anymore, but I'm you know, serving an audience that might be at a at a church that you're speaking to, or the audience that's watching a podcast like this, or taking a class with you. Uh, so, you know, the message has changed. But, you know, the bottom line is, uh, you know, we're here for such a time as this. And the most important things that uh, we should be doing is, uh, you know, sharing our faith with people, sharing our love with them, and, uh, uh, you know, teaching them to defend themselves on their darkest day. Yeah, I think that ties in a little bit slightly to the tidbit I was talking about, about how people identify themselves. What is your identity? And it could have been very easy for you to say, well, I'm a meteorologist and that's all I am. And once that's gone, what else is there? And you didn't do that. No, I've I've always kind of been, a, you know, I, I never was in the military. I tried to get in after September 11th and nobody wanted a 38 year old with thousands of flight hours back then. <laughs> uh I've always, you know, been someone who has alternate plans. So I always thought, you know, the business is a medical business. I had a great run 30 years, but many people go to a station and a couple of years later, they get a new manager or new management uh, takes over and they lose their job. So I always thought, well, I've got aviation I can do. I can teach the firearm. So I kind of did that all concurrently. Uh, to have other options, I never thought for a while, you know, all options would be taken off the table. But yeah. uh, definitely having that warrior mindset and that, you know, you just have to kind of recreate yourself and your, your value, as that Pastor Middlebrook said, is not in what you did, but who you are and you know, what, what, what do you believe about yourself? So to sit there. So as soon as I could start walking and 
and uh, you know, getting active again. So the, the hardest thing is I still want to perform at the level I used to. Mm-hmm. And that is still a mental struggle. And people continue to tell me, like, slow down. You know, you don't have to serve everybody as much as you did. You know, sit back and take it in a little bit. So, so that's hard uh, to do because I'm used to being on the go all the time. But uh, mm-hmm. I definitely can see from a health situation where not being as active uh, can, can be beneficial in the long term. I was watching one of your videos uh, that you have on your YouTube channel. And one of my favorite quotes from that was, you talked about uh, the imbe- the best instructors are eternal students. But then you right. said after that, no one has ever arrived. And yep. that is so true. I, I think everyone, um, a lot of people have these goals of, well, when I get to this, then I'll be happy. Or when I have this or this success or whatever. And that's not how life works. You don't you don't arrive and show up and then you're good enough, right? Or then you're it's all this built up nonsense, in my opinion. And of course, we always want to strive to be better. But when you said that uh, no one has ever arrived, I thought that was really, really great. Yeah. And really what, what I'm getting at there is and this is this is good for everybody. If, if you're looking for a self-defense instructor Humility is extremely important. If somebody's up there and they're going through their list of qualifications and they're telling you that they're the best there is and they'll never find anybody better, you need to walk away. You're looking for someone who has all the skills, but also has the humility to go along with it. So Mm -hmm. uh, I I would never want to tell anybody that, you know, I know everything it is about aviation or weather or whatever. You you have to be a humble servant. And that's uh, just quite honestly what impressed me so much about Adam when I met him at the active self uh, protection instructor courses, you know, here's a guy who's way more firearms experience than I'll ever had, but had that attitude of humility. And I I was drawn to that and several of the other people there. And uh, through that whole course, really, that was the one of the best things that came out of it was bonds with like minded people that you can share experiences with. So yeah, Mm -hmm. stay humble, keep moving, never thought you've arrived. The day you think I know everything about everything, someone's going to sneak in that you didn't know about and take you out. Yeah. That is true. And in, in anything in life, really, that's how that works, I believe. Yep. All right. Uh, is there anything before we wrap up here, um, John, that you want to make sure that people know? Um, we, we put up the website about how people can find out more about Iowa Firearms Coalition. Yeah, it's a uh, the Q&A. I would say one of the benefits of kind of being taken out of the weather world is, you know, when I was in meteorology, I got to associate with absolutely the, the really the founders of the Doppler radar system, the NEXRAD system that's in all over. I got to work hand in hand with with Les Lemon, who helped design that and train people all over the world and the top scientists, you know. And now as I've moved into the firearms teaching thing and meeting people like, like you and Greg Stevens from Texas and Stephen Williford and all these American heroes out there. It's like, how blessed am I to be a, a nobody firearms instructor from Iowa that is now, you know, meeting real life heroes and interviewing them and shooting with them and practicing with them. Uh, had a great gentleman we got to train with before he passed Pat Rogers, just a, you know, an insanely qualified person uh, that just took me and my kids under his wing and helped us along in our firearms journey. So I, you know, despite the problems with, you know, what moving from one career to the next, I just feel super blessed to be where I'm at. And uh, if I had the opportunity to go back and not get sick and stay in TV, I would not do it. I'd want to be right where I am right now. I love that. Hey, John, can I jump in here? Um, sure. So I'm a fan of your weather app that people have, Storm Hunter WX. Um, yep. So is that something you can tell people about? I don't know if this is something still you're doing, but I truly appreciate this. Uh, the one thing I'm looking for is if there's a setting to turn it to dark mode, I'd love to do that. But can you tell people about this app? Yeah. Because I think it's one of the best ones I've ever seen. In fact, I think it's the best one I've yeah. ever used. So you mind telling us about this? Because as people who defend life, it's important to know your weather stuff too. Yeah, so what we did in that uh, is I worked with a company called uh, Barron Weather out of Huntsville, Alabama, one of the leading technology companies in the world with radar systems. And uh, we built their first radar system with them, the TV station and I and Barron back in uh, 1996, serial number 001. So we designed algorithms to alert you to all these different threats. And when I left TV, I thought, how can we take some of this technology that 
that we developed to keep the broadcast world safe and just give this away for free basically to the public. So uh, that app is in a conjunction with them. It's been through several iterations. It lets you put in multiple locations. And so, you know, it's using algorithms which can fail and radar systems can fail. But if it sees rotation developing near you, it'll, it'll alert you on your phone that there's a twisting storm. Mm -hmm. There's lightning within 15 miles. It's going to alert you to that. So it's a, what we call a safety net. It's, you know, if you're not staying aware of what's going on, let's say you're at the range a couple of years ago at the uh, National Conference uh, in Kansas for active self-protection. You know, people are asking me, how far is the lightning? You know, I knew it already because I had it on the phone. We got people off the range in time. But the mm -hmm. app is called Storm Hunter WX. That's just an abbreviation for weather. So if you go to the, the App Store or uh, uh, Android, uh, you can download it. Um, it. It's just a new version coming out on uh, the, the Apple platform. And with all the different phones, we had to take away some of the, the mapping background. So that's why there's a light background right now, which I know I love the darker satellite images. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was just a way to make it simplified to work on more different phone things. Uh, but uh, that, that's in the list of trying to bring that back. But anyway, uh, it, it's free. Uh, my brother owns a car dealership in Iowa called New Way Ford. So he sponsors that to make it free. So there's not being pummeled with mm -hmm. ads and everything. But it, it's just a good backup. It'll keep track where you're at and let you know if there's a storm or you can put all your relatives locations in there and it'll send you a note and say, hey, there's a tornado approaching your kid's house in Oklahoma. Make sure he knows about it. Yeah, I travel all over the U.S. teaching, right? And I get yeah. I get notifications. I got one going through Oklahoma not too long ago. Another one in Texas. Another one oddly through Utah. And so it was it was really helpful to have. And I'm doing the same thing, putting my parents' stuff in here so I can kind of follow them too. So yeah, I thought that was I, important I people that. know about that. Yep. Okay. It looks like Scott just now downloaded the app. And Scott, you're not going to get a better weather app. So fantastic, <laughs> built by a genius. So yeah, we're thank uh, you. Yep, the Android version, we got an update that uh, I, I need to get on the phone tomorrow and get out to, to fix a few bugs in that. But uh, I think we're up to like 80,000 people using it now. So it's been pretty pretty successful for a free weather app. Word travels quickly when it's a good product. All right, let's get into a couple more questions here. Um, I'm not okay. sure who this is, but uh, they want to know, what can a church security coordinator do to address CCW holders in the church who they may see as a possible problem in a critical incident? So my philosophy on that is uh, let, let your church members know that we have an armed security team and we are more than happy to have you bring your concealed weapons into church, but please let us deal with it. And so even if we see someone coming that we don't know, and you can tell because they're printing because they've gained a little weight and their shirt's too tight, and you say, oh, that's a, looks like you're carrying a SIG 357. Uh, how did, oh, yeah, you can see it there. Anyway, just say, you know, please keep it concealed. Uh, no problem. You know, if there's someone rises, let us deal with it. If somebody's open carrying, we'll ask them to, you know, we understand you can do that, and we appreciate it. But, uh, you know, if you mind just covering that up or maybe – you know, lock it, lock it somewhere just so you don't uh, get people riled up if they see someone walk in with a firearm. But, uh, you know, we, we approve of concealed carry, uh, but we want to let folks know that, you know, we've got people appropriately stationed in all the right places to to intervene if, if the moment requires. Okay. Uh, another question. What would you say would be the next most important emergency medical courses to take if you have no professional medical background but have taken basic first aid CPR and stopped the bleed? Okay, uh, the, the next step after that, well, certainly CPR, uh, learn about AED deployment. Everywhere I go in, I look, okay, where's the AED? And I usually have one with me in the vehicle just in case. Uh, it's good to have that. Uh, stop the bleed is a good first step. They don't really get into chest seals. It's more just wound packing and tourniquets. So uh, look for a course that, uh, and Adam might want to recommend some, but there's several courses where you can actually go and and do scenarios. Kerry Trainer does some, Dark Angel Medical. There's a bunch of different uh, companies where you want to get your hands dirty, where you go into a setting, you're, you're under stress. So that's what I do in my classes, the one we did a couple of years ago at Active Self-Protection. You know, we bring people outside and there's a body with glass and a knife and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, you got the moulage blood there and people actually get stressed up. I, I did a church mm -hmm. training about a year ago in June and uh, 
you know, told people when you go outside, you're going to see a scene. You got to do a quick evaluation, do your assessment, you know, to figure out how you're going to work as a team to to treat this person. And some people, one was a police officer, and they got so shook up by the fake scene that they saw that they literally could not function. But unless you wow. put yourself under that stress, so it's more than just sitting in a classroom and putting a tourniquet on a on a, a, a foam gym roll or something like that to learn how to do it. Get into the classes where you can get your hands dirty. You got to go out and make assessments. Uh, and one thing I'm sure Adam would tell you is if you have a scene for real, number one, take care of yourself. Number two, be prepared that they may have weapons. You may roll somebody over to, to take a look at them. And I have seen where people have had guns, have had knives, and you got to deal with that in addition to trying to take care of them and uh, getting into the, you know, the drug world and Narcan and people coming back and wanting to fight and all that, that takes a, a higher level of training. But uh, get to the classes, like we mentioned, where you can actually do hands-on. I know here in Arizona, there's a company called Independence Training that has both one and two day options. Uh, uh, we're actually going to have to go out and do scenarios after you've learned the basic skills. Anything to add, Adam? No, no, it, it, absolutely. You got to do that, right? The scenario stuff is is absolutely necessary. Um, Neil's talking about sites. Yeah, go to a site where you can do this within a church itself and go to all the advanced training you possibly can. The more you can get your hands dirty and, and work through scenarios, the more training it is. And dealing with weapons, right? I've had a couple of different cases as a law enforcement officer in churches and other places where all of a sudden there's a gun there with somebody uh, they're paraplegic, or, well, let's see, they're epileptic or something like that, and you've got to deal with that. That's something church security may need to consider and, and implement into their training. Mm hmm Okay. Yeah, just yeah. Go ahead. No, keep going, John. It's fine. We don't mind. Yeah. So, so if you're on a church security team, the medical needs to be part of your plan. I've seen some churches that are just like, oh, we're going to call nine one one. We're not going to do anything. Uh, somebody can bleed out so fast, and it, it's probably not going to be from a gunshot or knife wound. It might be from the car wreck that's right on the corner of your church property. So take that very seriously. Uh, move beyond stop the bleed, and. If, you, if you're on a team or you're thinking about developing a team, set standards, set requalification, both for your firearms and uh, maple requalify on their medical too. So don't just make it one and done. Uh, right. Make sure everybody's staying up on skills and bringing in uh, more advanced folks than yourself to make sure you're up to date on, you know, there may be new approved tourniquets by, you know, the, the TCCC uh, that maybe weren't approved, you know, two years ago when you took your training. So stay up with everything, mm -hmm. getting back to that eternal student thing. Just don't take what you learned and carry it forward. Keep keep training and keep keep your mind fresh on, on everything new. Here's Absolutely. another question. Uh, in regards to the autoimmune disease, uh, how, do, how do you manage the symptoms of the bad days when you're training or teaching on the range? Yeah, with mine, I can feel it coming. And uh, sometimes I'll just say, hey, I gotta go sit down for a bit. But it's really about management and, and kind of understanding what your body can do. So I used to be able to work 18-hour days. And now the most I want to do in a day is about five to six hours. It used to be two. So it's a lot better than, than it, it was. So I, I really have to structure my day around the, the, my best hours are going to be like a five-hour time interval and structure what I do around that. But when I start feeling the symptoms of things coming on, like I'll feel pain in my joints and like a tingling, almost like an electrical shock. I just have to, whatever I'm doing at that time, I've just got to shut it down and, and go take a break. Yeah. That's about knowing your limits and being honest about, you know, how you're feeling yeah. that day. Once again. Yeah. I, I can tell you if you don't recognize those symptoms and try to push on, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's where problems can occur. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Anything else, Adam, before we wrap up here? No, John, it's so good to see you. Thank you for coming. It's just an honor to be, one, be your friend, and two, to be able to share your wisdom with everybody here. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate what you're doing, uh, both in Colorado and down in Arizona. And uh, thanks to all the, the folks up in Iowa that worked with us so diligently on our uh, campaign for the Second Amendment. And we're staying in that fight. There's a lot of new issues, you know, with the, the school taking care of that situation. And uh, uh, someone I hope you can have on the show soon is Ed Monk. We had him up in Iowa about 10 days ago and a fantastic presentation. If you want to open people's eyes of, uh, you know, the real answers to stopping these uh, you know, nut jobs that are going in and shooting up schools, it, it requires someone willing, someone present and someone trained. There's, there's no way around it. Mm. 
Yeah, Ed's good, man. I was happy to train with him last year. I'll be contacting him tomorrow. I'd love to get him on. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it so much.